Hello and welcome to the EDRM Global Webinar Channel. My name is Mary Mack. I'm the CEO and Chief Legal Technologist for EDRM. Today's webinar is a collaboration with EDRM trusted partner, eDiscovery Today, called the Important eDiscovery Case Law Decisions for January 2024. Our faculty experts are Doug Austin, Tom O'Connor, and the Honorable Judge Andrew Peck. We welcome your questions and feedback in the console. Questions will be answered both during and at the end of the webinar. And this webinar will be available for replay at your convenience for the next quarter, as are all of our EDRM webinars. Kaylee Wallstad, EDRM's Chief Strategy Officer, is here with us. Please tell us what resources are available. Thank you so much, and welcome, everybody. I look forward to this wonderful monthly discussion every month. And at EDRM, we are loving our ON24 platform with many more ways to engage. If you look and hover to the right of your screen, you'll see your console. It has many icons, one of which is a question mark. You can click that and type in your questions for today's faculty. Slides will be made available after the webinar has concluded. You can click the paperclip for related content and you'll see today's resources carefully curated just for you. There's an ON24 engagement tools descriptions PDF that helps you to better understand how to engage with the platform. Click the link to subscribe to eDiscovery Today blog and never miss a thing. I know it's my go-to in the morning for getting the news. So thank you for that, Doug. Yeah. And a a link to learn more about the Honorable Judge Peck and how to engage with him, and also a link to check out Tom O'Connor's spicy new e-discovery, spicy new book, e-discovery for the rest of us. And be sure to save your seat for next month's case law edition, February 20th, and up next on EDRM's webinar channel, February 8th, Data Retention 201 best practices for building and enforcing global retention schedules. Be sure to register for that. You'll see, um, just like Zoom, a smiley face emoji. If you click on it, you'll see many more reactions. We highly encourage you to test it out now. And then during the webinar, show a thumbs up, a heart, a like, and it, let our faculty know you're enjoying their presentation. And if you click the Twitter bird, you can follow EDRM and eDiscovery Today on LinkedIn. Back to you, Mary. Thanks, Kaylee. So our faculty today, Doug Austin. He, Doug is the founder and editor of EDRM Trusted Partner, eDiscovery Today. Doug's an established eDiscovery thought leader with over 30 years experience providing eDiscovery best practices, legal technology consulting, and technical project management services to numerous commercial and government clients. Doug has published a daily blog since 2010 and has earned JD Super Awards three times. Tom O'Connor, affectionately known as Tom O, is a consultant, speaker, and writer in the area of computerized litigation support systems, most recently the self-published eDiscovery for the rest of us. Tom's consulting experience is primarily in complex litigation matters where he's worked with firms of all sizes, including the plaintiffs in the BP litigation. He's also been appointed as a technical consultant by various federal and state courts on other cases dealing with large amounts of electronic evidence. And he'll be having a book signing at Legal Week. Uh, the Honorable Judge Andrew Peck is a Chambers-ranked senior counsel at DLA Piper, where he advises on copyright and trademark matters, and also serves as a resource for the firm and its clients on litigation strategy and e-discovery issues from a judge's perspective. Judge Peck retired as a United States Magistrate Judge in the Southern District of New York after 23 years, and he spent a lot of those 23 years writing our most uh, cited opinions in e-discovery, uh, boilerplate objections, 502D orders, technology-assisted review, you name it, he has written on it. EDRM is grateful to all three of these gentlemen for their service on the EDRM Global Advisory Council. And without further ado, over to you, Doug. All right. Thanks, Mary. Um, welcome, everybody. I, I have to say, you guys are really rocking it with the emoji, so got to love that. 
Um, believe it or not, it's been uh, over two months since we've discussed new cases here, uh, and uh, the cases are piling up. In fact, I think we've already uh, identified enough for next month. So uh, uh, you'll, we'll get to those then. Uh, in the meantime, we're discussing six cases this month addressing topics including Rule 45 subpoena requests, in-camera review and categorical privilege logs, remote, remote computer access for discovery of ESI, 502D orders in an IRS investigation, privilege determination of employees' work emails, and Rule 60B analysis, I think our first, uh, on judgment relief. Uh, as a reminder, we do welcome questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can, so certainly put those in there. And we'll send a copy of the slides out after the presentation, so look for that too. Of course, any ideas expressed by us here today are our own, not those of our organizations, clients, or partners. Once the disclaimer is out there, you can't claw it back. Ha! Ah, we saw what you did there. <laughs> In, indeed. Um, and before we get started with these cases, here's a quick note about the webinar format and sources of cases. This is the latest in a series of monthly webinars about case law, and the cases we discuss each month will be those covered on eDiscovery today. We provide links to each of the stories about the cases, which in turn have a link to the actual case ruling where you can check out the full ruling itself. These case law rulings are available courtesy of Kelly Twigger's eDiscovery Assistance site, which is a great resource not only for case law, but also for federal and state rules, checklists and forms, and a glossary of legal and eDiscovery terms. eDiscovery Assistant has over 34,000 lifetime federal and state case law rulings, and they add as many as several hundred cases a month. E-Discovery Assistant is a definitive source for e-discovery case law out there. So with that said, let's get into the cases. Our first case involves Rule 45 subpoena requests, and it was suggested by Judge Peck. In it, the plaintiff sued Juniper Networks in the Northern District of California, alleging its networking equipment infringes and induces others to infringe the plaintiff's patents. On July 28th of last year, the plaintiff issued a subpoena to non-party Microsoft with six requests for documents. Microsoft timely responded, objecting to producing any documents. After exchanging letters and participating in multiple phone calls, the plaintiff filed this motion, arguing these documents were relevant to show Juniper Network's induced infringement were not otherwise available from the defendant, and that Microsoft did not show the requests were unduly burdensome. The plaintiff also sought sanctions. Microsoft responded that the plaintiff failed to show that it could not obtain the requested information from Juniper Networks, refused to clarify its request, and never requested internal Microsoft documents in the first instance. Microsoft also argued that the plaintiff's six document requests for documents sufficient to show any Microsoft employees that are responsible for installing, testing, or operating the accused instrumentalities was actually an impermissible interrogatory. Addressing the plaintiff's Rule 45 subpoena request, Washington District Judge Kimberly Evanson stated, the subpoena includes six requests. The first five requests seek all documents, all marketing materials, and documents sufficient to show trainings provided by Juniper Networks on various topics. Correct transmission sufficiently explains the relevance of these documents to its inducement of infringement claim. However, correct uh, transmission fails to explain why only Microsoft would possess the communications between Juniper and Microsoft. If Juniper Networks provided the documents to Microsoft, both parties should possess such communications. A party's mere failure to produce without a meet and confer or other efforts to obtain the requested information is not enough to burden Microsoft, a non-party, to engage in discovery. She also stated regarding the sixth request, this request is an interrogatory disguised as a request for production and is not admitted, permitted under Rule 45. Notably, Correct Transmission repeatedly referenced its request for and the relevance of internal Microsoft documents. The sixth document request is the only request that could be possibly that could possibly indicate internal Microsoft documents because it is the only request not limited to documents provided by Juniper Networks. Because this request is an impermissible interrogatory, correct transmission's argument to compel production of Microsoft's internal documents also fails. So Tom, since the uh, court noted the plaintiffs sufficiently explained the relevance of the documents related to the first five requests, do you think they should be able to get those Microsoft uh, those documents from Microsoft if they do meet and confer with Juniper Networks first and they don't get them? Or is there something else they need to do? 
Well, I think they need to try that. The judge pretty much lays it out, as, as you said, right there in the third paragraph. Mm -hmm. uh, a party's mere failure to produce without a meet and confer or other efforts, he said ominously, to obtain the requested information is not enough to burden a non-party to engage discovery. So you you got to have the meet and confer um, and, and attempt to do that and then go forward from there. Um, later in that same paragraph, uh, uh, the, the court noted that the Sedona conference um, recommends, quote, seeking production of documents from non parties only after meeting and conferring with the party who either confirms it does not possess the requested do documents or does not respond within a reasonable time, end quote. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, you know, you got to try to get them from them. You would think that they could, again, as the judge pointed out, I you know, you would think both sides of, on, a, on a piece of communication would have copies. And and so just, you know, meet and confer and try to get them and then take it from there. Yeah, makes sense. So Judge Peck, Judge Evanson ruled that the sixth request was actually an interrogatory disguised as a request for production. If the plaintiff can't get the information from Juniper Networks, which doesn't sound like they can, how are they supposed to get that information if they can't submit an interrogatory under Rule 45? Well, the first thing uh, to make sure the audience is remembering is Rule 45 only allows either testimony, meaning a deposition before trial or trial testimony, or document production from a non-party. Does not allow interrogatories to a non-party. So uh, correct transmission could have um, <coughs> sought a deposition of Microsoft about this. Um, but I also disagree to a certain extent with the court's ruling that that sixth request was an interrogatory. You know, the use of documents sufficient to show, as opposed to all documents, has been recognized for quite a while as a way to get documents without burdening the recipient with having to produce every single thing. So I don't know that, you know, a document sufficient to show if what they really wanted was who are the Microsoft employees that were responsible for testing, initiating, operating the accused product, you know, I don't see a problem with that. I think the problem uh, is that they asked for one thing, who are, in essence, who are the people, while telling the court that they wanted the request to be enforced so they could get internal Microsoft documents, which mm. they would not have gotten from this request. So all in all, you know, they, they went about this uh, in, in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly agree. So uh, let's talk about the right way. So Mary, what recommendations do you have for our audience regarding best practices for issuing third-party subpoenas under Rule 45? Well, third-party subpoenas are always um, unwelcome, <laughs> you know, to the people that they that they are propounded to. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly uh, uh, dotting your I's and crossing your T's, as Tom said, uh, you know, seeking seeking the production of documents from non-parties only after meeting and conferring with the actual party you should be getting the documents from, who then says, yeah, we have them, uh, or we don't have them, or we're just not going to give them. Uh, but, you know, to, to do that, and then also uh, to pay attention to when you ask for them, and, and the, uh, the party, the non-party says, uh, we don't want to give them to you, you do have to answer that with a reply. <laughs> I think that would be a good thing to do. Um, and in this case, that that uh, that appears to have not happened. Uh, so I think, you know, people talk sometimes about deep pockets. I think we have deep data, and Microsoft certainly has a lot. And generally, they, you know, they comply with their e-discovery <laughs> obligations. And uh, it may have been thought that that was the easier way to get the documents rather than going direct to the source uh, uh, where they should have. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, Microsoft uh, is no stranger to litigation. So 
I'm sure that maybe that that was a thinking as well. Who knows? But but mm -hmm. definitely great points and, and great advice. Uh, and uh, with that, we'll move on to our next case, uh, which relates to a legal dispute involving a ground lease agreement for the construction of a bank, a bank branch. And uh, this ruling ad addressed dueling privilege related motions. In the first uh, motion, the plaintiff requested an in-camera review of and to compel the defendant to produce 74 documents uh, that were listed on pages two, to, uh, two through four of Exhibit 17, or at a minimum, the 12 documents that the defendant admitted were between non-lawyers. The plaintiff claimed the defendant was playing a shell game to hide information regarding the decision and rationale to terminate the lease. The defendant claimed that it turned over every non-privileged document, its privilege log adequately explained why other documents were privileged, and uh, the plaintiff could not articulate why reviewing the documents was not sufficient. In the second motion, the defendant sought an order requiring the plaintiff to detail the documents it claimed to be privileged, rather than provide a categorical log so that the defendant and the court may, uh, might fully uh, assess the privileged claim and to perform an additional search for and produce responsive documents. The defendant indicated it didn't believe that only two emails between uh, the plaintiff's principles existed for this period. The plaintiff argued that it produced eight, not just two, non-privileged emails during the period between those principles, and also argued that the stipulation order only required categorical logs and requiring it to produce a detailed log was improper. The plaintiff also contended that the defendant's motion was only meant to divert the court's attention from the plaintiff's motion. That never happens. I'm um, just kidding. No, uh, New York Magistrate Judge James Wick stated, here the court declines to engage in an in-camera review for several reasons. First, Capital One has complied with the local rules in providing an adequate privilege law. It states the description of the privilege as well as the author and addressees of such document. Second, conducting an in-camera review would be a mere fishing expedition and would not yield any further information than 6340NB already possesses noting the plaintiff requested information and spent hours deposing several Capital One employees. Judge Wicks also stated, here 64, 6340 NB has sufficiently asserted privilege, like Capital One for its opposition to 6340 NB's motion, 6340 NB's privilege logs comply with the local rules. Notably absent from Capital One's motion to compel is any indication that 6340NB's log fails to comply with the local rules or that there is an improper assertion of privilege. Critically, and perhaps even fatal to Capital One's claims, is the fact that the parties agreed to exchange categorical privilege logs. It would be unfair for 6340NB to now have to supplement its statements based on Capital One's mere assumptions. Further, courts in this circuit have found that categorical logs are indeed acceptable and appropriate under cir certain circumstances. And uh, he cited the NRA Actos Antitrust case we covered a couple of years ago in, in that ruling. So Judge Peck, if the privilege logs comply with the local rules as they did for both parties here, wouldn't a request for an in-camera review always be a fishing expedition? No, uh, you could comply with the requirements for the log, but that the information actually on the log raised questions. So for example, you know, one might have adequately listed who the author was, who the recipients were, and if none of those were lawyers, or if one or more of the recipients appeared to be outside the company, you know, that could be an indication uh, that there was a waiver of the privilege. So um, you could comply and still there could be questions that could be answered by in-camera review. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, so interesting. So, so Mary, given that the parties agreed uh, at the outset to exchange categorical privilege logs, do you agree with the plaintiff that the defendant's motion was only filed to divert the, to divert the court's attention from the plaintiff's motion? No, I, 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 well, I can't, I can't get into their minds um, right. to say that that was the reason, but you never want to see an opinion that has words like kerfuffle fisticuffs and notorious. So one of the things that discovery kerfuffles 
have <laughs> permeated this case with each side engaging in a linguistic fisticuffs for some for quite some time over a hand list of issues. So that was one thing. And the other was being uh, called notorious on e-discovery. So you never want to see that. Um, I think that was part of it as well. And, and who knows what motivations were, were there. Yeah. Um, and uh, kerfuffle is one of my favorite words. So I, I can't believe I missed that. So uh, um, <laughs> great catch there. And certainly uh, uh, a pretty lengthy, um, uh, you know, uh, decision that where neither motion was granted. So, um, so party, uh, so Tom, while the parties agreed to exchange categorical privilege logs here, um, that's not always the case. So what would a party need to demonstrate beforehand if uh, they wanted to provide a categorical privilege log when it wasn't agreed to beforehand? Well, luckily there's some, some great guidance documents out there for people to look at back in 2014, the commercial division of the Supreme Court of New York adopted a rule uh, supporting uh, actually a preference for categorical privilege logs. And, and then shortly after that, the uh, New York City Bar issued a paper called it Guidance in a Model for Categorical Privilege Logs. So it, it talked about why you would want to do one, use one, and then gave a model categorical privilege log. Um, in terms of why it talked about you know, different types of privilege, whether the privileges being asserted were pre or post complaint, um, which was sort of a bright line they used and, and the high volume of documents involved, they quoted um, uh, SEC versus Thrasher, uh, which was a Southern district of New York case. So, um, perhaps judge Peck was uh, familiar with that, uh, in which they said the justification for a categorical log is directly proportional to the number of documents withheld. That was also citing another case called Tyco versus Mutual Pharma. And then the other, and it's quoted in the New York City Bar um, paper, the other really good resource, I think, is a, a, a paper by Judge John Fasciola and, and Jonathan Redgrave. Who, this... who, who? Judge who? Judge, <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard that name before somewhere. If only he were around to give us any comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that one is called Asserting and Challenging Privileged Claims in Modern Litigation, uh, the Fasciola Redgrave Framework. Um, and, and really, I thought there was a great quote from there that sets what you're trying to do and what your rationale should be. Uh, and the quote is that the object of the exercise is to create a set of natural differentiations among documents so the party can say with confidence what is true of items within category within a category is true of the whole uh, end quote so uh, i take a look at both of those for some some real good solid uh framework for how to deal with privilege laws categorical privilege laws. and just uh, a, a, a historical note when rule 26 b5 that requires logging of privileged documents was put into place I think it was 1993, but the advisory committee notes say something, and I'm loosely quoting, if only a few documents, they can be listed individually. If there are a lot of documents, they perhaps should be, should or could be listed by categories. So categorical goes back to the history of the rule. I think to a large extent, categorical logging is replaced to a certain extent by metadata logging. See ah. the EDRM um, privilege log protocol material. Right. Yeah, well, you both have given me uh, a, a great blog post idea to follow up and on some of these <laughs> resources. So I've made a little note about that. That was very informative uh, uh, for from all of you. So uh, uh, thank you for that. That's, uh, yeah, definitely uh, uh, I will be following up with you uh, to uh, write this up, write, write about it as a blog post. Um, so great stuff. Um, we'll move on to our next case, uh, which was short. Uh, in fact, much of the ruling is on this slide. Um, and it was suggested by Tom, who worked on the case. Uh, the case involved a dispute over the manufacturing of an automobile. I guess you can probably guess what brand from the uh, uh, from the style of the case. Uh, and uh, the plaintiff sought an order compelling the defendant to produce certain data regarding the subject vehicle underlying the action. 
The parties appeared for an in-person hearing before the court on November 1st, 2023, where California Magistrate Judge Susan Van Kulen issued several rulings regarding the instant discovery dispute. As you can see here, Judge Van Kulen ordered the defendant to provide plaintiff access to the remote computer setup by November 10th, 2023, uh, in both the RFP categories, uh, as you can see there, that first bullet point in each of those. Um, and uh, the plaintiff was at, granted access to the data and the software for the duration of this action. Um, and then you see the handling of the production for the two categories of data unfolded there on the screen. Uh, the order also called for amendment of the protective order to treat any screenshots or video captures created by plaintiff in connection with his use of the remote computer setup as highly confidential attorneys eyes only information under the protective order. It required the plaintiff to limit use of them to this action, of course, maintain a log of what the plaintiff captured and destroy it all within 60 days after the action concludes. So Mary, a lot of discoverable data these days are in systems like the ones at Tesla where the most useful form of the data is often within the system itself. Are you surprised that more parties don't request access to the source systems uh, like the plaintiff did here? Oh yeah, I am definitely surprised at that. Uh, but <clears throat> I just I just love this case. Um, I I I was compelled to like go through go to the documents and take a look at the people and everything like that because uh, the requests belie a, a technical sophistication and uh, you know like a warrior heart. And why not see? The car's view of an accident with all the diagnostic and reporting data that's within the car and all those hard drives and uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the data that's beamed uh, to the cloud as well. Uh, and, and then you look at what Tesla did and they put some great words in there, as you, as you said, to limit the impact uh, of sharing the screenshots and data for any other personal injury or probably IP related uh, case. Uh, so, uh, so this case I think is one to watch. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, serving it up to us. Yeah, well, yeah, and like I say, thanks to Tom for uh, uh, for uh, um, suggesting it. And and Tom, since you worked on this case, I won't ask you specifics about it. Uh, but in general, how often have you seen courts order direct access to party databases like Judge Van Kulen did here? Uh, in in <clears throat> in my consulting career, I've only seen three. Um, like Mary, I'm always surprised that more people don't ask it, ask for it. Although, you know, it, it tends to be intrusive and judges aren't going to, you know, are going to be kind of, I think, disfavorable to people poking around in other people's computer systems. Um, uh, a lot of it just depends on, on, on what's available. And some of it depends on uh, how easy it is, what, what the system is they want to look at and how easy it is to get the data out. The two cases, the other two cases I'd been involved with were um, the signal shipbuilding case here in New Orleans where um, the company's IT person just, you know, frankly admitted he, he didn't have the SQL chops to get into the system and produce what we were looking for. And so the judge allowed us uh, to bring an SQL expert in uh, and, and query under the direction of the, uh, of the uh, defendants, um, uh, the system. Uh, the, the third one was involved our old friend Craig Ball, where he he actually uh, ordered that he be allowed to query a system directly, um, and and sat down and did that. And and um, he was a special master in a case. I'm sorry, I should have pointed that out. Um, and he did just you know, Craig Ball showed up and said, "Hey, I want to look at this. Let me let me in here." Um, <laughs> uh, he was a special master in the case, and there was. It, 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 there was a lot of back and forth, and he finally said, "Look, I'm I'm going to go in and sit down and take a look at what's in this system," and and he did, um, and um, but that's it. Three times over over my in, entire consulting career, it, it doesn't happen too often. In my experience, sounds like in Mary's either. Very true. Yeah, not, <clears throat> I would just say, you know, more usual is to require the party and the you know, that would be the equivalent to Tesla here to run certain programs or create certain programs, um, you know, on their system as opposed to letting the opposing party directly access it. Right, right. In the in the signal case, that's what we asked. In the uh, it was it was it was an interesting 
example because um, the uh, company had basically purchased a, a system and and so they could run pre-canned queries and knew how to you know do some certain functions but they really didn't have any sql experience and and, and admitted that and said look you know we had asked to, to to do exactly what you said judge peck and 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 they professed uh, uh some inability so that's when the, the judge said all right well I'll, I'll let the the other side i'll let the plaintiffs bring in an sql guy but he's got to be you know working with the it staff sitting there and and, and it, 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 it all became fairly cordial it was you know let's try this let's do this et cetera, et cetera. sure yeah very interesting um uh, before, I, uh, well, I, actually, I'll ask J Judge Peck. I'll ask your question, then they would have a question from the audience here. So, Judge Peck, for both the car log data and the and the um, snapshot APBIS software, the court provided access to the data and the software for the duration of the action. Shouldn't there be a cutoff date, just like there would be with any production? Yes, uh, I'm not sure if the judge was, you know, talking loosely here. Presumably, it might have been for the duration of the discovery period or up to the time of the summary judgment motion if there was one or the pretrial order if the case was going to trial. Um, obviously, it wouldn't make any sense to have access for use only in the case once you were past a point in the case where that information could be used. So. I think it was just shorthand for the discovery period. Mm -hmm. Okay, At least interesting. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, that certainly would seem uh, more appropriate. So, a question from the audience here: um, uh, Was there? Not, uh, I'm going to read it. Um, uh, was there a requirement regarding identifying who is the individuals? And I guess by requiring identifying who, I mean who has access. I believe is what she's asking. Um, any? Any uh, thoughts on that? Now, I mean, presumably, as Tom was suggesting, it would be an expert or technically uh, qualified attorney for plaintiff who would be doing the access. And I'm sure if it were multiple, you know, repetitive, access attempts, uh, they would wind up being further court intervention to control it. I, 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 I don't know the answer to this, that. I don't know that I can answer that, even if I do know. So I will, I'll, right. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> understood. I, I'll, yeah. Right. That's why I, I, I stayed mute there for a second, but I'll, right. I'll ask my client, A, if I can address it, and if so, what the answer is, if I can, I'll pass it along. Okay, uh, fair enough. And, um, oh my God, I, I just have to say, we finally had an AI question. I knew it was coming. Uh, it was coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, uh, what do you know? Um, it's, one of the, <laughs> it's one of the few places we don't really talk about much AI. So I'll ask the question, have any of you seen AI predictive coding applied to review source data such as this, as opposed to email MS uh, office documents? If so, how effective was that? Well, I haven't, but it's only a question of time until somebody tries to do it. I'm sure, I wouldn't be surprised if we see somebody offering something like that next week at Legal Week. <laughs> I, 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 and I, I, I concur with Tom. I think um, the facility that AI has with source code to be able to do things like um, take something written in Visual Basic and put it into uh, C++, um, you know, things that you couldn't do very easily without humans. Uh, it can be done by AI now. Um, and I think it's 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 a short step to be able to compare that that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. I mean, yeah, I, I agree that it's, if it's not there, it's coming. Um, and certainly um, I probably will make it in, into case law at some point too. So uh, I expect to see more of that. Uh, all right, we'll move on to our next case. Uh, which is about one of Judge Peck's favorite topics, 502D orders. Um, in this case, involving an IRS investigation of the respondent, the parties agreed to most terms related to the proposed report and recommendation, but were unable to reach an agreement regarding the five, Rule 502D issue, which led to the respondent's uh, Rule 502D order request in this 
its motion. Specifically, the respondent requested, respondent res requested that the court issue an order authorizing respondent to produce summons materials to the IRS without first reviewing every record for privilege, stating that respondent would not be deemed to waive any privilege or protection as a result of such disclosures in connection with the litigation pending before the court or in any other federal or state proceeding, precluding the IRS and the Department of Justice's tax division from making any public use of any document produced pursuant to the summons without first giving captive 10 days advance notice and allowing respondent thereafter to assert a claim of privilege in writing within 10 days, which would then foreclose the government from making any public use of the document until the privilege question was resolved either by the parties or the court. In support of the proposed order, respondent explained that the items it must have delivered to the IRS total over 1.1 million and that the protections it sought were necessary given the costs associated with reviewing and producing such a significant volume of documents and the near inevitability of making mistakes in doing so. Of course, the IRS opposed the respondent's motion. Regarding the motion, Florida Magistrate Judge Christopher Toots stated, Cap Captive's motion fails. To begin, as the IRS emphasize, emphasizes, the instant proceeding is summary in nature and does not involve discovery as that term is understood in civil litigation. This action is thus distinct from other matters in which courts traditionally enter Rule 502D orders at a party's request or for good cause shown. Indeed, it appears that had captive complied with the summons upon receiving it, the IRS would have not uh, would not have initiated this proceeding and Rule 502D would not have come into play at all. In denying the, the motion, Judge Toot also stated, Captive's proposed Rule 502D order is problematic in another respect as well. As the IRS observes, the order places no temporal restriction on when Captive may designate a document as privileged. Accordingly, Captive could theoretically challenge the IRS's use of the materials years after their production. Such an unlimited time frame could likewise be read to oblige the court to retain jurisdiction indefinitely over any dispute regarding the use of such information. The court is disinclined to take on such an unbounded commitment. <clears throat> so, Tom, if captive had placed a temporal restriction on privilege designation, do you think that would have given them a chance for the 502D order to be granted, or was it doomed given the nature of the proceeding? Well, I'm going to channel my inner Tom Cruise here and say, uh, <clears throat> what's in your order there? Uh, doom. Um, you know, the, the the judge, I think, laid out three reasons why it failed. The temporal one was last. Um, uh, first, it, 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 the judge said the, the, the motion fails because it's it's a summary proceeding. It's not a discovery proceeding, as he said, quote, in, as the term as that term is understood in civil litigation. So, you know, he, he kind of dinged it first and foremost on that grounds. Uh, then second, uh, uh, of course, he went into a lengthy discussion about um, you're asking the IRS to make the privilege determination. Um, and, and so now I'll channel my inner Amy Winehouse and say, no, no, no. <laughs> that's, that's a big no, no. <laughs> and then third, the judge got to the temporal restrictions and uh, noted that the, the proposed order places no temporal restriction on way they may, when they may designate a document as privileged, and and then said, "quote Such an unlimited time frame could likewise be read to oblige the court to retain jurisdiction indefinitely over any dispute regarding the use of such information. The court is disinclined to take on such an unbounded commitment." Uh, end quote. So yeah, I, I mean, d doom. This this one had doom written all over it. Yeah, certainly seems that way. So. Judge Peck, obviously you're a Rule 502D uh, advocate. Do you agree with the decision to not uh, grant the 502D order? And what, if anything, could Captive have done differently for the order to be granted? Uh, I do agree, but with the you know big caveat that it's because of the facts of the case here. That is that it's an administrative subpoena, wouldn't have even been in court so you couldn't have gotten a 502D order if captive had not refused to produce the requested data. So it sort of made it into a court litigation solely to get the 502D order. And that's not quite what 
was meant. But more generally, you know, there were really two purposes behind the enactment of Rule 502D. One was the oops factor, that you don't want to be accused of waiving privilege because you couldn't pass the 502B requirements from your production when you were trying to screen for privilege but didn't do it well enough. The second was to allow, uh, usually by agreement, this sort of um, sneak peek approach. We'll produce everything and then we'll worry about privilege down the road. You know, in the pre-502D, but paper days, you know, my old firm uh, would sometimes put, you know, 40 boxes or whatever the amount was pulled from the client's warehouse in a conference room, give a few uh, um, post-it notepads to opposing counsel and say, here, tell <laughs> us what you want as you review this. We agree. We haven't waived by letting you go through this. And once we see what you really want, we'll review that for privilege. So some approach like that might have been viable here. Some restriction on how long captive could have to go through the material and declare that some things are privileged and it want it back as opposed to forever. Uh, there is also, and I don't know if you can waive ethics requirements, mm. but if IRS lawyers, not just IRS staff, were reviewing this, the ethics requirements say if you see something that looks privileged, you got to stop looking and put it aside and all of that. And to put that sort of review on the opposing side's head is very unfair. Perhaps captive could have said, you know, we waive that. Do what you want with this, but at some point we will tell you what we think is privileged. We just don't have the time or money to review uh, a million documents now. You know, maybe some things like that could have made this uh, passable. But I, I don't disagree with the judge's decision as big an advocate of 502D as I am. Okay. All right. Interesting. Um, so, Mary, what do you think of one of the IRS objections that the IRS agents investing captive, investigating captive are not trained to evaluate whether a communication is subject to the attorney-client privilege? Is that captive's problem? Well, you know, I think Judge Peck, you know, said it well about the um, the IRS attorneys. You know, they've got their they've got their training, they've got their ethics, but here they're talking about agents uh, that are probably right. not attorneys. So is that captive's problem? I, you know, I think it is. Uh, they're the ones that want to avoid the time and expense of reviewing for privilege before production. And so they want to do the quick peek, the sneak peek, uh, and usually the other side rifles through and they're able to kind of tell on its face uh, if something's privileged and, you know, go through a, go through a, like a, a protocol around that. Um, and uh, and so since they that's what they wanted, it is their problem that the people receiving the documents don't have the training to do the privilege uh, review and, and send that stuff back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Certainly a uh, much different type of case here when it comes to 502D mm -hmm. order and uh, very interesting uh, look at um, a different, uh, you know, a different type of investigation. So uh, uh, with that, we'll move on. Um, and here's, a, we, we, we have a several, I think three privilege cases this month. Here's another a privilege related one uh, that was suggested by Judge Peck. And here the plaintiff was an employee of the defendant uh, Department of Veteran Affairs and brought action against the defendant for employment discrimination and retaliation under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. During discovery, plaintiff propounded on defendant interrogatories and requests for production, seeking email communications and other ESI related to her claims. The potentially responsive items included approximately 20 emails between plaintiff and her counsel or her counsel staff within her work email account. Uh, defendant's counsel properly, promptly sequestered those communications from her review and notified plaintiff's counsel of possession of the potentially privileged communications. Good for them. 
After meeting and conferring, counsel were unable to agree on whether the documents were protected by any privilege. Because defendants' policy stated that employees do not have an expectation of privacy when using their work email accounts or computer systems, and that such systems are monitored, that plaintiff received actual training to that effect, and plaintiff still used her work email to communicate with her attorneys, defendant claimed that plaintiff waived the attorney-client privilege for those communications and any work product privilege for documents that were attached to those communications or saved on her VA electronic file system. Plaintiff did not respond to defendant's action. In analyzing the dispute, Missouri District Judge John Ross stated, as the party ostensibly claiming the benefits of the privileges, Sickles bears the burden of establishing the right to invoke their protection. She has not done so. She has not responded to defendant's motion or otherwise demonstrated that the documents are privileged. But he also noted, even if she had responded, uh, defendants show that Sickles waived any attorney-client privilege. Defendant has proffered evidence that Sickles did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy on her work computer. Defendant's policies limit use of government office equipment for personal use. Defendant also provided evidence that it requires employees to acknowledge that their activity is not private through a security warning banner every time they log in and access their account on a VA computer system. It provides annual training about these policies. Sickles has undergone this training since she began her employment with the VA in 2012. And Sickles was warned in April 2018 not to use defendant's instant messaging system for anything that she wanted to keep private. This evidence shows that Sickles has no had no expectation of privacy on her email account and server. The disputed communications are therefore not protected by the current attorney-client privilege. <clears throat> so Judge Peck, given the that the communications were coming from the plaintiff's work email address, shouldn't plaintiff's counsel have done something to direct her to use a different account? And if so, does she have a malpractice case against her attorney? Well, I don't think it's a malpractice, but certainly best practice would have been for plaintiff's counsel to tell her not to use her work email, not even to use her Gmail personal account or anything like that over her work system. That's best practice as opposed to, you know, malpractice related. The other thing is there are, believe it or not, cases going both ways on this question, depending in part on the particular facts. Uh, on December 21, the Oregon Supreme Court in Scholar sued versus LPM, either C or G. Tough to read my own handwriting at times, but it's 2023 <laughs> Oregon Lexus 665. Uh, under Oregon state law, the court held that an employee's email with her personal attorney were presumptively privileged, and the employer had the burden to show that the emails lacked confidentiality. In that case, the employee submitted an affidavit that the employer did not monitor email, did not give notice to the employees, and that the emails were password protected. Not exactly sure what she meant by that. Um, I would also note that back in the early days of e-discovery, and if Judge Warshawski is on the line, he might remember there were, within a month of each other, two conflicting cases, one out of New York State courts, one out of New Jersey, reaching conflicting decisions on whether emails over the employer system like this were or were not privileged. That's interesting, because um, I would have not expected there being decisions both ways. So, um, yeah, very interesting stuff there. So, Mary, um, what recommendations do you have for our audience to protect communications with counsel when involved in an employer dispute? Well, one thing would be to live not in the United States. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pri <laughs> pri privacy elsewhere is 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 very much uh, you know very much more protected. Uh, but as Judge Peck said. Um, you know, having employees uh, communicate with their attorneys on platforms and equipment that are not owned and controlled by the employer, that that would be 
uh, something to do. And then if necessary to communicate on a work system, they should clearly label the communication as privileged, attorney client privilege, password word protected, in, encrypted. But um, I mean, it, it, if the employer owns the system, you know, and that's the and that's the party that you're you're going against. You you pretty much give up. Um, you can give up your strategy. Uh, uh, you can say things to your attorney that can come back to to haunt you. Um, yeah, it's a terrible thing to do. I think to uh, to have a grievance against your employer and then use use their tools uh, to try to get uh, to get some relief from it. Uh, it's yeah, it's uh, I yeah. I. I yeah, I suggest going elsewhere, uh, other unencumbered platforms and uh, 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 equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, indeed. To borrow Tomism, it's a head scratcher. Um, so, um, so Tom, uh, based on what Judge Peck said, uh, I, I, this, I guess the answer to this question may be uh, uh, moot, but I'll ask anyway. If the defendant hadn't conducted annual training and provided a security warning banner, do you think the plaintiff could have succeeded in claiming emails as privileged, or was she doomed simply by the fact that they were from her work email account? More doom, huh? Did you watch that movie last night? or <laughs> Doom? I don't know. It just seemed like a good word to throw out there. <laughs> I no, I, you know, I, I think the underlying um, policy is what drove everything here, um, not the training, not the ban. Um, and as the court pointed out in that last paragraph there, they, you know, the, they offered evidence that there was no reasonable expectation of privacy on the work computer because their policies limited the use of equipment for personal use. And that was made clear to employees. Um, I, I think the banner... Uh, you know, every time you log in, you get a, a warning that comes up that says, you know, not for private use, no reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, I mean, I think that was the icing on the cake. The training, yeah, I, I mean, that obviously that also helped, but I, I, I think the banner was the, um, you know, was was really the, the, the coup de grace. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 in your face every time you log in. So yeah. certainly, uh, certainly uh, true, uh, true there. So um, uh, real quick, someone's asking, uh, could she get the info on the Oregon case again? Uh, Judge Peck, um, uh, do you, can you provide details on that? Yeah, and I think I just put it in a bad answer. It's twenty twenty three Oregon Lexus six six five. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Great. Good enough. Um, all right. Uh, so we'll move on to our last case. And believe it or not, we almost had a sanction-free caseload for the first time uh, until this case jumped in at the last minute, uh, which uh, was covered by Michael Berman on his site and also the EDRM site. So thanks for that, Michael. And it invokes our first Yogi Berra reference of the year, which is, oh. analyst, any guesses? Smarter than the average bear? <laughs> wrong, wrong yogi there, Mary. <laughs> Fair right. Hanging over till it's over. Fair right. um, uh, very good. Very good, Tom. It's never over till it's over. Uh, this case involved claims of excessive force by Officer Tincher of the Logan Police Department in West Virginia. Uh, Morgan, uh, the plaintiff, submitted discovery requests to Officer Tincher well before trial, but 10 days after the deadline established by the district court's scheduling order. Morgan asked Officer Tencher in the interrogatories to disclose any allegation that had been made against Tencher by any person while Tencher was employed with the police department, as well as litigation involving Tencher and any documents relating to lawsuits or claims of excessive physical abuse or physical assault while Tencher was with the police department. Without objecting to the untimeliness of Morgan's discovery request, Officer Tencher responded to the interrogatories and other requests. <clears throat> in his response, he disclosed one prior allegation of excessive force made against him by a suspect named Anthony Meade, who had alleged that Officer Tencher unjustifiably kicked Meade in the head while arresting him, but did not disclose that Meade had filed a civil lawsuit against him, claiming during testimony that the suit was dropped. After Morgan finished presenting his evidence, he learned from a third party about yet another lawsuit claiming excessive force against Officer Tencher, which was filed two months before Morgan's trial. 
that Tensure had not disclosed from an individual named Travis Fortune. The next morning, Morgan filed a motion for sanctions based on Officer Tensure's failure to supplement discovery with information about the Fortune lawsuit. However, the district court did not address the sanctions motion or Morgan's request to question Officer Tensure about the Fortune lawsuit before the jury reached its verdict in favor of Tensure. Subsequently, in March 2021, the district court denied Morgan's motion for sanctions. And six months later, the district court denied Morgan's motion filed under Rule 60B for the verdict to be reversed over the discovery violation, leading to this appeal to the Fourth Circuit. <clears throat> In its ruling, the Fourth Circuit Court stated, we first conclude that Morgan established misconduct by clear and convincing evidence based on Officer Tensure's failure to disclose evidence of the Fortune lawsuit. Morgan's interrogatories and requests for documents made clear that he was seeking disclosure of any lawsuit in which Officer Tensure was a named party. Rule 26E requires a party who has responded to a discovery request to supplement or correct its response in a timely manner if the additional or corrective information has not otherwise been made known to the other parties during the discovery process. Thus, Officer Tincher was required to supplement his discovery responses when, six months after his initial discovery response and two months before Morgan's trial, the Fortune lawsuit was filed against Officer Tincher. They also noted Although Officer Tincher raised other objections to Morgan's interrogatories, he did not assert that the requests were untimely. Further, the district court did not make a finding of good cause that would have excused Officer Tincher's failure to raise this objection. Thus, we conclude that Officer Tincher's failure to disclose evidence of the Fortune lawsuit, irrespective of whether that failure was inadvertent or intentional, was misconduct under Rule 60b-3. So the verdict was re reversed over the discovery violation and remanded with instructions for a new trial. <clears throat> so Mary, this case seemed to come down to the lack of objections over the timeliness of the discovery requests. Do you think it would have ever gotten this far had Officer Tensher objected to the timeliness of the request in the first place? Well, it might have, you know, with good cause and all, but it would have been more of an uphill uh, fight. The lack of objections mm -hmm. to timeliness was a very convenient hook to, to hang things on, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Um, Although, if I so, could jump, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go if ahead, I could jump in, I just wonder if the officer objected and the plaintiff moved to compel whether all of this would have come out before trial or right at the beginning of trial as opposed to in the middle, the end of trial. But that's just guessing. Sure. Yeah, um, that's that's a, a fair point. Um, so one one of the things I found interesting about reading this case, Tom, was shouldn't the district court have addressed the sanctions motion before the verdict? Uh, you know, this one is a multiple head scratcher. Um, <laughs> and I, in addition to the points that Mary and the judge just raised, I don't get it. I mean. The judge seemed to be aware of of Tensioner's duty. Um, the transcript, if you read the, the, the transcript, it's, the judge at one point said to Tensioner's counsel, quote, don't give me that look because you have a duty to supplement discovery responses. We're not going to stop this trial right now because of this. We're going to continue on. This might not go well for you if Morgan's counsel can demonstrate that he requested this information and you didn't provide it. You're on notice of that but we're not going to deal with it today, end quote. Um, Whoa. Yeah. And then, of course, Morgan <laughs> counsel at that point asked to recall Tinchner to the stand, um, trying to, right. I, I would imagine, set up a, a, a perjury claim because he had said he didn't have anything else outstanding. And the judge said, well, file a motion to, to Morgan's counsel, which they did the next day. And then before any of that, came to a came to fruition the jury came in and and then it got, right. it can get kind of kicked down the the road a few months so I, 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 I I'm I'm baffled quite frankly As I said, I'm scratching yeah. my head furiously with both hands here the judge seemed to know what was going on seemed to realize you know Tincher's responsibility and 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 then the jury came in and it all kind of it was a kerfuffle <laughs> oh, there we go. Yes, this is uh, 
this may be our record for kerfuffle uh, references in a in a webinar. Um, and yeah, I agree with you, Tom. Uh, but it was to, a, to it answer was your a direct question, yeah, <clears throat> I, I thought it should have been, but for some reason, the judge didn't want to interrupt the proceeding and and deal with it at that point. Or maybe it just all happened. Maybe maybe he was going to, and and then the jury came in, and you know, you know, life took over the way life sometimes does. Um, I don't know. Sure. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, then I mean, they could certainly still then have, um, you know, uh, eventually granted the sanctions motion or, or what have you, but they didn't. So, yeah. so Judge yeah. Peck, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Judge Peck, did you ever have to rule on a sixty Rule sixty B reversal request before? And what would you expect for the filing party to demonstrate to grant the motion? And do you think the Fourth Circuit got it right here? Yes. I, well, I think the Fourth Circuit got it right. I join. Uh, Tom and Kerfuffle land uh, <laughs> district court clearly, you know, should have dealt with this. May or may not have ruled appropriately, but by just pushing it off, et cetera, et cetera, um, it just created a mess for the circuit to, to deal with. I had one case where I had to reverse part of a uh, jury decision uh, it was, I know we're at the two o'clock, so I'll tell this story in the shortest form. Three young men created this company. One of them got bought out by the other two with a two-year payout. Um, the, the mother of that boy then sued the two remaining uh, partners, saying, well, I too was a member of this uh, entity, because I did some secretarial work, and I should get a third or a quarter of the business. Uh, the jury quite correctly told her to go away, but the defendant also had an, I don't know, abusive process counterclaim or something of similar ilk. Plaintiff's counsel never moved to uh, dismiss it. Um, and the jury awarded something like $50,000 for attorney's fees under that claim to the uh, defendants, but uh, the claim did not state all of the elements necessary for that sort of abusive process claim. So I granted the partial 60B to uh, uh, get rid of that, although hmm. the woman was clearly a liar. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so uh, interesting. Um, uh, so uh, I'm uh, going to move on to our contacts page. We do have a, uh, I know we are a little past the top of the hour and we do have a couple of questions and comments we didn't get to. So I'm going to try to do that right now. If you all want to drop off, um, uh, our next case law webinar is Tuesday, February 20th. Uh, which is close enough to Valentine's Day to display the heart, which looks remarkably sim similar to a Staples easy button. <laughs> um, so if, <laughs> before we sign off, though, let me get to a couple of the questions and comments here. Um, one comment, uh, back when we were talking about the uh, the remote access case, um, he's an IT professional who's dealt with that access issue on multiple cases, and he says the result of queries is often insufficient, uh, which is certainly true. And what if the counterparty brings up a database argument past the discovery deadline that needs to be examined or rebutted? That requires access to continue throughout the action. Uh, certainly a great point there, and thanks for um, thanks for providing that. Um, a question uh, that uh, we um, uh, that I'm definitely interested. I haven't seen it yet. Has anyone seen a discovery request for Gen I related data? E.g., please produce all prompts, identify training data, etc. Um, I haven't seen it yet, but I expect we're going to be starting to see cases that involve Gen AI related data as as ESI that's discoverable. Um, uh, and, uh, I've, I've, and certainly OpenAI has got several cases, litigation cases, where I'm sure that's going to be the case in, in some of that. So um, have any of you seen, uh, seen that, uh, um, uh, Mary, Tom, or Judge Beck? I and, have. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, Mary. Go ahead. Uh, the Sarah Silverman case uh, <clears throat> yeah, around yeah. the Writers Guild yep. uh, has, some, has some great language in it. Uh, and and they uh, they were able to demonstrate 
uh, that their works were contained in the in the training data, you know, basically verbatim. Um, uh, and so I would I would encourage you to to look for that one. Yep. Go ahead, Tom. Not what she said. <laughs> and, and and tagging on there in the New York Times, the Times yeah. case against uh, uh, OpenAI, um, there were also uh, accusations that the prompts the Times used uh, were uh, designed to show uh, copyright infringement as opposed to a more broad uh, prompt. Right. Yes. Right. Exactly. The I think OpenAI claimed those were those prompts were outside of the terms of service, but we'll see what happens there. So yep. um, yeah, uh, definitely. I one thing I you know being a GPT four user, uh, unless you t unless you change the um, uh, change it otherwise, um, it keeps your uh, queries indefinitely. I've noticed. So <laughs> I have queries going back a, a year. So certainly, uh, I would imagine a lot of other people are in the same boat. Um, and, you know, so let's if, see here. If, sorry, Doug, if one is in litigation, better not turn off that feature that allows for the storage of prompts. Right. right. Indeed. Ooh, yeah. Absolutely. Because there, there is there is a, a quick, easy turn off button, but uh, yep. you should not do that if you're if it's subject to litigation. Great point. Uh, somebody pointed out that the announcement for the next webinar says February 20th, 2023. Yes, that's on me. Yes, it's actually 2024. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not in the past. So, oops. Um, uh, okay, let's, uh, one Peabody. person guessed deja vu all over again for the um, <laughs> yogi yogiism. Uh, that was uh, what I expected someone would guess. Uh, and then one comment here in response to Judge Peck. I was familiar with the cases he referenced uh, from antiquity. Uh, personally, in a Chambers conference, I remember a lawyer uh, telling a lawyer 15 years ago that even though his client used his own AOL account from the office, computer was not privileged in any way. So certainly, um, the, the it's not just the location, but um, you know the uh, but but um, the uh, the account as well. So great point from Ira there, and I think we've hit them all um, here, at least as far as I can see. So with that, I'll say thanks to Mary, Tom, and Judge Peck for their terrific insights as always, and I'll turn it back over to you, Mary. Well, thanks, Doug, and. Uh... I want to thank you, Tom, and uh, the Honorable Judge Peck for this wonderful uh, discussion and presentation. Our thanks to the EDRM community for your kind attention and all those emojis. Uh, we will see you next time on the EDRM Global Webinar Channel. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye, all.